today on Real Life. Charisma Magazine publisher Dr. Steve Green brings his powerful new leadership book, Love Leads. Plus, the hard questions pastors deal with an ethical medical question. And the movie about Apostle Paul that's coming to the big screen. That's today on Real Life. Welcome, this is Real Life. God loves you, Jesus died for you, the Holy Spirit, He empowers you, and the Bible is your and my guide to abundant life. I'm your host, Don Black, with my beautiful bride, Terry. Hello, good big, day. Big special guest today. We have two co hosts, Amy Schaefer, Pastor Amy, and Pastor Jay. It is an exciting day today on Real Life. Oh, yeah. Oh, it is. <laughs> you should feel the room. I yeah. know. Oh, they're seeing them. <laughs> some of the best looking, smartest people in all of America right here. Now, is there that's one right. out there that's the, that you're thinking the, about? The hottest pastor in Pittsburgh <laughs> is here on the front row. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to embarrass him. Close up on <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad to have we're all of you guys with us Facebook here. They're here for a very special reason because That's we've right. got a tremendous guest today. I'm going to tease you a little bit about this because I want you to stick around. If you've tuned in to the right place, That's because right. if you have an excitement in your life that you want to see your life change and move in a powerful new direction, and you know God's got something more for you, you just yeah. know that, but you can't quite find your way, then you've tuned into the right place. Because that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about finding the way, making the change, watching God take you to where you could never go yourself. Well, guys, in that, in that tease, we, I saw that about the Apostle Paul. Did you know that movie was coming out? I didn't know that. I did not. I didn't even know. That looked like Hugh Jackman. It's, it is Hugh Jackman. They're making a movie about Paul out of Hollywood. And Hugh Jackman is is starring in it. Do you know anything Do you about know who's it? Who's doing it? Who's yeah. Yeah. You know, I I don't know who's producing it, who did the screenplay, but I can tell you this: Paul's my favorite, other no, than Jesus, no. my favorite Bible character. Right. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm looking forward. To, I hope they don't mess it up like they did Noah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what I was but wondering. How many, how many people? Noah. Noah. You're right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Noah, though caused people to go to the Bible and read the actual story of Noah. That's true. I know a lot of people, I don't I didn't know if that was in the Bible or not. And so they went and reread the story okay. and then bring that to modern day as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, mm -hmm. when the coming of the Son of Man. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think even even if they're not based from a Christian perspective, at least it'll stir some things up. Well, and get it, people it sure did. And reading the Bible, it did stir things up. That's I just right. pray. You know, here's what I pray: that just like Mel Gibson had on the Passion of the Christ mm -hmm. when they, he made that movie, that there's an anointing on it. Because yeah. I agree with you, yeah. a little bit right. of, is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But if it has the anointing of the Holy right. Spirit on it, right. you know, and and people are just grabbed by God mm -hmm. by watching it, that could change a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Movies make that possible. That's power in movies. What draws them to Christ? What, I'm going to go a little bit. Jay, what's your favorite movie? Can you give me, what, what's your favorite movie of Christian all time? Christian movie? No, yeah. no, 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 no. Oh, no. man. Favorite movie of all time. If you had to times. watch one tonight. Tonight you got to watch a movie. What Jeez. would you watch? Jeez. There's so many. I, I like a lot of the uh, real life movies, not <laughs> going off the name, <laughs> but uh, like just things that are from life. So like, um, um, what are, like autobiography movies, things I like that. Uh, even things like Malcolm X, I like things like mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, um, Selma, um, things yeah. along that line. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I love Bio those fiction. type of movies. Yeah, nonfiction. Ask me. I'm waiting. For, I know. I know you got one. I know exactly. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, but first, I'm going to ask Amy. <laughs> Hands down, Hands Julie up. Andrews, The Sound of Music. Whoa, oh, I can identify. But Everything that's else pales in Lord. comparison. That's right. I, Sorry, I the hills are always alive. They're still alive. Yeah. They're still oh, singing. Oh, it's okay. always good to sing. <laughs> yes, and it's every year. I, well, you can watch it all the time now. Yes. That's oh. right. I'm okay, Gary. Okay. My, well, I know yours. Well, I'm not. Okay. What, do you want me to tell them yours? Well, you could do that next. Okay. Mine is Pride and Prejudice. 
I yes. love that Jane Austen movie. Oh, I couldn't watch story, that. A long, oh, in yes. intricate love story. I know it's just the awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but John's favorite I know movie okay. is okay, what is it? The Outlaw Josie Wells. That, that's really good. <laughs> that's I one right? of my favorites. That's one of my favorites. Yes. Outlaw Josie Wells. Yeah. Clint Eastwood. Clint yeah, Eastwood. Almost like Eastwood seventy movie. years ago. <laughs> I mean, all of these. I'm like, what's something <laughs> recent? <you know? laughs> Seventy years ago. Seventy years ago. Did you hear he said that? I heard him say that. that. Seventy years ago. Well, yeah, yours is old. It was in the 30s or 40s. The sound of music. I mean, man, it's old. Well, you get this <laughs> in your you, pink tie, pink shirt. You definitely know the sound of music. I don't know anything about it. My wife knows about it, but I don't know anything about it. His wife bought the tie and the shirt, little, too. That's right, that's yeah. right. Hey, you got to be confident who you are to wear pink. You got to be. Right. You do. You got to yeah. know who you are. That's right. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. All right, all right. I agree. Except for when with our red and pink, we look like we're Valentine's Day. Yeah. It feels a little bit like Valentine's Day here on, right. on the set. Oh, my God. Well, I, that, the reason I ask that because movies have really great impact. Yeah, that's right. They really, um, yeah. they'll, they'll impact you either for good or for bad. I mean, one, mm -hmm. one way or the other. So when movies are made that could have the potential to yes. impact for good, right. I, get, I get excited. Absolutely. Would, just real quick, fav, favorite Christian movie? Favorite Christian movie, um, mm -hmm. two of them, Passion of the Christ mm -hmm. and The Encounter that we had Bruce Marciano oh, yeah. on oh, earlier. Oh, wow. or yeah. Next, yeah, last mm. week. Last yeah, week. yeah, yeah. Oh, I gotta think, pa go to Terry. The okay. War Room. That was awesome. Oh, that was good too. Yeah, yeah, that was really yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, you can't take mine. I know. Yeah, sorry. Okay. You said yours. <laughs> 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 yeah, well. so I have a, a, a lot of movies. I don't know. I can't think of one. There's right a lot. There's going to be more and more good there Christian is. movies yeah. out. That's right. You know. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's uh, Passion of Christ, my favorite, hands yeah, down. Right, good. Now. Yeah. Yeah. right yeah. now. Yeah. Right now. I like. I would like for it to be uh, to re to get another one because that's been a little while ago. But we watch it every Easter. That's we, watch, totally we, we watch it every yeah. Easter. Well, we have some, as you already kind of saw, some shots <clears throat> that we have special guests with us in the studio today. Mm -hmm. They're pastors and leaders. And one of, uh, our staff, Tom McGuff, is our connection with Pittsburgh Faith and Family Channel. And I want to ask you, Tom, tell us about who we have in the studio with us today. Well, thank you, Dan. Don, and indeed, it is a glorious day in the Lord. We have our Faith and Family Channel pastors. Mm. Now, I just have to tell you that we started with five pastors, five churches, and now have over 100 pastors and ministries that are part of our fellowship. So I want our pastors to give the Lord a nice round of applause. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Look what the Lord has done. I'm partial, but it's the best thing on TV, hour after hour, to see and hear the wonderfully anointed ministries that are involved and all preaching Christ and Him crucified. Pretty amazing stuff. Praise be to God. Well, we're going to be talking more with our pastors. We have a very special guest, but now it's going to be time for us to answer your hard questions. Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together and we take on the questions from the day right out of the Bible. And today, I'm your moderator, Don Black, and on today's panel, Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Chris Gibbs, pastor of Crossway Church in the Mars area, and my favorite movie is Remember the Titans. <laughs> Pete Jack Looney, Rainbow Temple Assembly of God Church in McKeesport, PA. My favorite is Woodlawn. Awesome. Pastor J. Anthony Gilbert, Kingdom Restoration Christian Center on Mount Washington. Oh, okay. Wood, oh, Woodlawn. Oh, yeah, I saw, I saw Woodlawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He threw me for a curve. Woodlawn. Woodlawn. He's still stuck well, on Woodstock. Yeah. <laughs> Back 70 years ago. Well, here's a question, right? Uh, called in to us. Is it okay for Christians to be sperm or egg donors? Well, there you go. <laughs> well, we better send Jay home for this one. <laughs> Welcome to our studio audience. We're so glad that you're here today. We, we take all the questions. Any questions? I was going to ask you, Don, what's the name of this program? <laughs> well, yes. 
It's not hard copy, brother. Hard questions. It's hard questions. Well, is it? Oh, it's, there's a, that's a legitimate question. It's a concern. Is it okay to participate? You know, in that kind of science. Well, you know, there's basically two views that uh, is in the Christian community. Uh, one is is that you know God is in control and that he has the power to give life. You know, you look at certain situations, he shut up life in a, in a lady's womb. Mm -hmm. and, and also, he gave life uh, to a lady who wasn't looking for a life, you know, and that was Mary. Right. So, you know, uh, God is able to, you know, give life uh, when it's needed. But then on the other hand, you know, people will say, well, you know, there's technology, mm -hmm. and God has allowed technology to advance to the point where man can take and I, and, and I qualify this and say, man can take what God has already put here yeah. and use that to give life. Yeah, so um, I was talking with one of the pastors uh, before, and he brought up uh, something in Genesis 38 looking at Onan, and Onan didn't donate nothing, and it cost him his yeah. entire life. Yeah. Uh, there, was, there was something there. But here's the thing about it. You know, yeah, we've got, or, we've got organ donations. We've got all these kind of things. Technology has moved in a lot of ways. And on that kind of ethical sense, uh, you know, God is the author of all life. But here's the thing we got to look at. If you're going to donate something, uh, you got to look at where are you donating that to? Because if, if, if my seed is going to somebody else, I, that life is still a part of me. And am I willing for that life to be born into a home where God is not going to be a part of it? Am I willing for that child to be born into uh, a, a, a family unit that I don't believe represents biblical values? What responsibility to God do I have for that life? Yeah, well, that's a, that, that brings a lot of uh, ethical questions to the table. Pastor, what do you say? Well, I think kind of along the same line that he's talking, um, I don't, the Bible's silent pretty much because the technology and all that wasn't there at that time to do that. But I, I agree with you. If you're going to pass on, no matter what, even That's though right. that child, you may not physically be raising it, that is your son or your daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, that is a life you're bringing into the world. And what type of a life are they going to be, what type of a home are they going to be raised mm -hmm. in? You know, are they going to be in a homosexual family? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there could be a lot of things that you have to consider. So the act itself necessarily may not be a sin. In, but right. what it could do possibly to the child, even as the child gets older, mm -hmm. you know, they'll begin to question, why did my father sell me? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of things you have to think about besides just the fact of, is it wrong to give the sperm? Mm -hmm. The reality is, is yeah. what type of ramifications is it going to have on the child later on in life? Well, I agree with everyone, what they've said here at the table, the morality, the, the total morality of, of how you're going to get to everything that you're going to get to. And then it, the, the idea, like you said, uh, Jay, the, the selling, the, uh, I think that was part of the question, the selling. Mm -hmm. So now we got a moral issue. Now we got a, a financial issue. Do what's right before the Lord, and and uh, again, play the whole thing out. It's just yeah. not a, a quick answer. You got to go right down the line, like you said, Jay. Where what kind of home is this child going to be raised in? So. Uh, but Don, look at it this way too. There have been, and I, I know I've known families that have gone through the whole, whether it's in vitro or something with donations, and they prayed, they tried everything they possibly could to have story. a child, Different and story. they kept on going, and uh, and you know, and God blessed them, and and those children were born, and a lot of times it wasn't a child that ended up being children, you know, uh, twins or multiples, right. and the child was born up, and and you got to look at that. Okay, does that child still have a purpose? Of course, that child has a purpose, because no matter what doctor was involved or donation was involved, that life was purposed of God. And so I believe that it's not a one size fits all, uh, but I think that it, it all depends on, you know, the heart and the motivation of it. And, and I'd like to say, you know, because if we go back to the question, you know, it was asked, is it all right to, to do this? Yeah. And so, you know, to the person that's considering doing it, the question that I would ask, what's your motive? Yeah. You know, and if, uh, if you have the wrong motive, then, and, and God is not going to be glorified in the situation, then, you know, you don't yeah. need to do it. Well, uh, this is about is real clear. It's for profit. It's for making right. money. Right. Well, yeah. Then I, I would I would have a question there. You know, if it's for profit, and then if you're saying that I'm doing it because I need money, well, then I would have to go back and ask, well, where's your trust in God at? Yeah. You know, if 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 you are do, if doing it because this is a, a form of income, you know, I'm not necessarily sure that that's the kind of income God wants you to I get would that way. Being opposed, yeah. opposed it all the way if it's just strictly uh, motivated by money. Yeah, because I thought we outlawed the idea of selling life. Yeah. We don't we, we don't do it. Yeah. Life is not to be for sale. Life has already been purchased. Yeah. 
Life has been purchased. Yeah. And if you look through Scripture in Jeremiah 1, 5, before you were born, I knew you. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. Uh, Psalm 139 that says, I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And the fact that Jesus went to the cross to redeem life, life is not for sale because it's already been purchased. And but see, what happens in, in this case, I'm sure this is what happens, uh, the egg or the sperm isn't considered life until they are unified. Now, even in, in today, we don't consider a fertilized egg life in a technical term. That's why we allow abortion. You know, conception doesn't equal life, which is, which, which is false, obviously false. And we, none of us are going to argue that. But science says that right. to us and that that it's not a baby that's inside the womb. It's a it's just a tissue. Right. Until some mystery but point now of mystery. There's a biblical argument uh, against that, of course, and that is when the idea that you look through biblically and all the generations were already in the loins. Yes. Already in sure. the loins. Sure. And so that life, God looks, the Bible says that life was already there, even though there was no egg that joined it yet. Because if God knows me before I was ever conceived, that means in the very seed of my father, God said, You were in my mind before you got in there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it goes even beyond. On what science says is life. Well, that's our that's our way that we can excuse the act of an abortion. You know, we can write it off as being, well, this is just a medical procedure. Where's the line between science and ethics like that? I mean, if a if a if a husband and wife say that they want to take, uh, and they can't have a baby, and they want to take the sperm and the egg and have it fertilized and then put into a place for it to be, uh, for that child to be birthed, is that okay? Is that okay in you guys? I, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Yeah. Again, the morality of selling and buying, but if, if it's a biological problem that they, that they and, and, and medical science can put things together that they can have the, the desires of their heart, having a child, I, I have no problems with that whatsoever. Well, and I think that, you know, God is, is, is glorified, you know, and, and I think somebody said earlier, when that child is raised in, in a home where, you know, uh, it's getting the, the input from the Lord, being strengthened in the Lord, and, and, you know, that child can grow up to be, you know, the, a great champion for Christ. Yes. Well, let me say this too. A lot of people don't know this about it in vitro is that a lot of times they don't just take one sperm and one egg. They fertilize a bunch of them. And then if one doesn't work, then they take another one. So one of the things, if you get it done, you don't want them aborting a bunch of fertilized eggs either. So a lot of times people don't understand that, that there's not just, they don't just take one and do that. Now you can request that, but a lot of times they'll do a bunch of them in case one miscarries. So if you miscarry, it's naturally doing it versus aborting all of those fertilized eggs uh, because you didn't need to use them anymore. Or they take those sometimes and they use them for research, things on that line. So that's another thing we need to consider when it deals with in vitro. Yeah. I saw a news story where a famous couple had done exactly that and they had this <clears throat> group of fertilized eggs that uh, they had put aside for future use, mm. you know, because they were too busy in their career. Both of them were famous. So they were going to do with those child something in the future and then they broke up. <laughs> you know, then it became a legal argument. Right. Who's, Who, whose babies are these? You know, and they went to court to sue each other on custody of the fertilized egg. Unbelievable. I mean, that's that's how deep the water yeah. to get. Yeah. And you go, wow. Well, that's a good question. Thank you for sending it to us. As I said, we'll take any question. You know, we're we're not afraid to. Uh, these pastors aren't. I, you know, who, I'm not pastoring, but these guys, they know. They know what the, the word says, and we're happy to have you guys. Thank you for taking the question and making it clear for our family at home. If you've got a question, send it in to us on email at uh, questions at C, hard questions at ctavn.org, or you can call the number on the screen right now and ask our prayer partner to write the question. That's the easiest way to get your question in. Just call right now. The number on the screen, say, hey, I've got a question for the pastors. And you will uh, get in the queue and then just keep watching the segment on Real Life and then our program. We have a half hour program yeah. that airs uh, during the week. And get involved with the, uh, with the Hard Questions family. I, I've got a special treat coming for myself. Dr. Steve Green's going to be here in just in a minute. He is a, a, legend, a legendary educator, trainer, pastor, businessman, entrepreneur. He, uh, God has used him in multiple, multiple, multiple ways. Now he's pointing those skills to leadership, and I can't wait to hear him. We'll be back after this break. I'm, I'm a harvest, harvest partner. partner. God has given me so much. And so I love to give back to him as a Cornerstone Harvest Partner. My $25 a month is going directly to helping people. I know I'm making a difference. 
Being a Harvest Partner makes me feel valuable. Together. 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 We can change the world with the power of the gospel. Call now to join the extraordinary team of Harvest Partners with your gift of just $25 or more a month. Want a way to share Bible verses, inspirational photos, or uplifting videos with your friends and family online? Like the Cornerstone Television page on Facebook. Every day we'll keep you updated on show info, behind the scenes facts, and daily inspiration from our exclusive photos, videos, quotes, and more. Go to facebook.com slash cornerstone television to connect with us. We want to hear from you. Let's spread the good news of Jesus to our family and friends online. Amy, through your education, your training, and all of the things that, as a young person, you had coaches and teachers, I know, that yes. were important to you. Oh, yeah. And, and they really are the ones who have impacted and really shaped my life and who I am today were those coaches and teachers. I'm forever grateful. They build precept on precept, you know, and, and help us to grow. And Dr. Steve Green now is the publisher of Charisma Magazine, and he publishes other other publications in that family, in that, in that family line. He wrote a new book called Love Leads, and I wondered why, and I asked Dr. Green why it's taking him this long to write a book, and <laughs> we'll get back to that question in a minute, but Dr. Green, thank you so much for thank coming you. here and be Such part an of this. Such an honor to have you here. Yeah, thank you. There it is. He's kind of from my neck of the woods. What neck is that? He was in Bigsby, Oklahoma. Oh. Yes. So right away, we talked football. Yes. <laughs> We didn't talk about OU though. No? <laughs> no. He's a, yeah, we're kind of half friends. Yeah. <laughs> We're half friends. What's Amy always, what do you always say? What's your little sooner? Sooner born, sooner bred, sooner living, sooner dead. <laughs> That's what they say. That's what they say. And I thought well, I got out of Oklahoma. <laughs> out of Oklahoma. Oh no, we will haunt you. <laughs> well, you know, the part, I don't know where to start with you, actually. I know, yeah. Your first time here, let's start with family. Yes, sir. Tell us about your family. Real quick, uh, my favorite movie is God's Not Dead. We can't let that out. Oh, God's yes. Not Dead. Because I want to participate in that conversation. Oh, yeah. Both of them, but probably two more than one, and he's got a third one coming out, so I can't wait. You're right. Anyway, I have a wife of uh, 43 years, two yeah. children, and three grandchildren, and uh, our family activity is usually golf. The other golf. part of my family, my daughter likes, their whole family is a family rodeo. So oh, is that right? I'm not so much into that, but I'm learning. I love her. Yes. <laughs> you've, you've touched the nerve. Yes. Sir. Well, go, golf is a fun sport to play as a family. And um, now that home, home for you is where? I'm in Orlando, just outside of Orlando and Lake Mary. Oh, you're down in Florida. Yes, Did sir. you get impacted with this recent storm? Yes. We lost a week at Charisma Media. You our did? building was down a week with power and our homes. It was, it was really rough. It was the hardest. I've been a little bit through hurricanes, nothing like this one. It was a tough one. And Orlando's inland, so you don't normally... You wouldn't think, but it came right at us, so we, we did okay. We're not as bad off as some of the folks in South Florida. Well, let's get right into this whole topic of leadership, Dr. Green, and the best way to do that, for I think for our family at home, give us a little snapshot of your resume. Where did you... Mm -hmm. What did God... How has he brought you down this, this path to get you to where you can write this book? Well, I think I learned most of it in the classroom. Uh, as, to be as honest as I can, when you lead students year after year, you learn a lot of different, everyone's so different and has to be led differently. Uh, I love teaching C students. And uh, you know, I, I do well with better students, but I would rather teach just the average student who thinks they can't and to see what God's got in them and try to pull that out of them. And I think that was the essence of the birth of leadership the way I try to teach it. I, I don't think leadership is 17 steps. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think it starts with love. And that's how I started the book with that first sentence that if we don't have love, how can we possibly lead anyone else? God is love. God loved us, he leads us with love. How then shall I lead if I don't have love? It doesn't, it seems so simple, but it evidently is complex because there's not a lot of love leaders as we all know. So is this book about leadership? Is it about relationship? Because you also bring in principles for home. What, yes. how, what does this book encompass? I think it's first, from the first page to the last page, it's love. 
and and relationships mm -hmm. that a caring and a, a working with people in a way that goes beyond line and staff ritual management my way or the highway those kinds of leaders I think they've seen their their days and they're numbered the Millennials today let's just pick any demographic I'm a boomer I'm 64 you didn't ask that question thank you but <laughs> we're, we're in that place where we've got to do something more than what's been done in the past mm -hmm. we can't lead with either X or Y or Z uh, no carrot or stick, doesn't matter. We just have to love people, and that's not as easy as it sounds, nor is it as difficult. Mm -hmm. But God leads us, and that's, that's the direction that I have, is that as God leads us, we're to lead others. It's not really that different. Well, we've got a studio full of pastors, and they have different sized staff, some large, some small, some maybe they're the staff themselves. Sure. What do you mean when you say, how do you lead a staff by love. I mean, don't you have to have goals and don't you have to have uh, measurements and don't you have to have discipline? All and, the above. Well, how, how, how does that all fit together? Well, it, it fits together in the way that how I treat you in a relationship. Let me start in the home yeah. because most of your listeners or, or viewers right now are going to be more concerned with the home life anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and right. I believe I started the book to write home leadership mm -hmm. because all of us as pastors, as leaders, the people who work a lot, uh, we have to take it home. We have to live it at home and the cacophony that exists between how I act at work, how I act at home, is something we've got to repair. That's what the millennials are looking at us to do, is to be real, to be the yes. same at home as we are at work. And so if I walk in my house and I'm different, or if, mm. as my wife has said to me once or twice in our 43 years, <laughs> Leave that manager voice out there in the car. I don't need to hear that manager voice in the house. Oh, that's good. I'll thank uh, you yes. for that. And tip. once in a while, I, you know, I find myself in that. You know, why this or what about that or why haven't you this? And I get corrected pretty quickly, but uh, I should be, uh -huh. you know, because love is. I, I, I've had this in counseling quite a bit and working with other couples and uh, some pastors and leaders. Why? Why am I different? I don't want to be different at home. It's because most people relax at home and they just kind of let it out and they are what they are maybe in a heart. I think it reveals our heart. And what I pray ultimately before I get out of the car is that just as the prayer I pray when I open that door in the business is creating me a clean heart, oh God, let my heart be pure and clear for my family. If I only give my best to people at work, I, I'm really limited mm -hmm. and come home and dump on my wife and my kids and mm -hmm. you know act like a jerk mm -hmm. or less than what I should be, mm -hmm. that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Love leads at home first. That's a good word. I, I'm thinking about Abraham right now and, and Sarah, and, mm -hmm. and you bring up uh, Abraham in, you know, the faith of a leader. Yes. You know, so many times we're making decisions as leaders that test our faith to the core. What do you have to say about faith and leadership? Well, it's one of the reasons I use Bible characters in all my chapters mm -hmm. to try to demonstrate stories through the Word. There's a lot of Bible in this book because I think that's our best teaching. Mm -hmm that you don't need me to give you my 17 principles. I just show love through these active leaders. So as we get to faith mm -hmm. and understanding the discipline and difficulty that he would have had to have to do what he did with Isaac, to, to, to move at a, mm -hmm. at a ripe old Same age, way, yeah. to pack up and move to Beverly, you know, and <laughs> to do what he had to do in life, it was not easy. And so what I try to say through faith is I've, I want it to be exercised at home. I want to hear, my yeah, kids need to hear right. me speaking faith. That's it's, not, it's not a church word. Don't you, th don't you think that our culture doesn't celebrate leadership? In fact, it's very difficult. Look at it from the national perspective. Yes, if you look at the president and how he's, as a leader, trying to make changes, trying to do things, and how that is such a hard thing for even a man I'm not saying he walks, he's leading by love. That's some, maybe we ought to send him a copy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying he is or he isn't. We can get it autographed. But, but, but just hope, the, the point, I guess, is this, that leadership is, is now diminished in our culture. Mm. And I think what we've seen because of some of the results in our culture, because we have, we've, we've, we've spun in many ways in the wrong direction because of lack of leadership. That's right. There is a... It's amazing in 2017 that we have such a valley, a dearth of, of leadership. It's, we're lacking. Where are they? Where are the leaders? And, and again, I think that spurred the book as much as anything because I think they're there. I think maybe we're all searching for the real leader in me to come out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get this young. You know, I was, my models were all tyrants and, 
table bangers, especially in broadcasting. And, you know, they were tough. They were harsh. Mm -hmm. It was my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'm the anti that. And God has drawn me into a, a little higher place to try to teach what it looks like to love and still correct and lead and accomplish goals. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about, um, it's not just a position that makes you a leader, mm -hmm. but it's the influence behind it, but more importantly, the relationship that you have yes. with that, like you, leaders, you point out in this book, really need to care about the people that they're leading. And sometimes there can be a disconnect in leadership. I'm, I'm just the boss, I'm the manager, I need to get this done, and we're getting all these tasks and goals, and, and we're, we need to execute big things, but it's really about that one-on-one -on -one relationship. It is. Uh, let's go to my friend Barney Fife, who is a positional leader. All Barney had was a position. He had a badge and a bullet, and he was about done. One bullet. One bullet. And please don't take it out of your pocket. And, yeah. But then you look at Andy, and how would you describe Andy? He was, had oh relationships. God. Yeah. He walked down the street, talked to people, asked questions, he knew about them. He was, it was the Mayberry. Boss. I yeah. miss Mayberry. Yeah, I do too. But at the same time, they got things done. Yeah. And when it was time to be tough, he could be, and he, he always executed good symbols of leadership. We've used episodes to teach leadership in seminars mm -hmm. that it's so clear. But position is nothing. It's, awesome. it's so low level, it means nothing. If yeah. I've got to tell you, you know whose name's on the door? You know who runs this place? Let me right. tell you, what, here's my card. Do you know who I am? Yeah. Those are things that just signal we're struggling. Maybe we're insecure. Yeah. Maybe we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. Well, many times, many times leaders get in positions because somebody's left mm -hmm. and they get pushed into it. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody who's over them that's their leader. And so it's, it's replication of style. The, the analogy has always been if you want to look at an organization's character and personality, you go to its, its, its founder or its, its leader and that represents the organization. And I think that is, there's some accuracy in that. Well, we can take that a step further and say, uh, when we work for a company, we may work for a large company, but we work for that boss. That's who we see in the morning. That's the guy that, or the lady who really impacts us, and that's how we define the company. And so good companies shove leadership down as low as they can get it. Uh, there's not this hierarchy, this command center, the general at the table that runs it all. He leads it all, mm -hmm. but it doesn't run it. There's a big difference. That's, hard. that's a hard one. Yes, sir. It Spe is. Especially, let's go back to the home. How does, a, how does a husband and a wife partner together in leadership? They talk a lot. Talk a lot. Mm -hmm. They have really good communication. And, and all the pastors in this room would say that, that you know, the most, most well-run churches have really good communication from top to middle to, you know, depending on how big their staff is. There's a lot of good talking and leadership listening. Mm -hmm. You know, the best thing I can do as a leader is make sure that I've heard my team, mm -hmm. that I've really heard them, not just let them talk, mm -hmm. but heard them and can respond to it. And normally the greatest ideas come bottom up. You know that? Great ideas are all over the company mm -hmm. and, and throughout the home. Mm -hmm. And opening those channels mm -hmm. yes. takes work. Yeah. Yes, sir. Really, it takes a caring. It mm -hmm. takes heart. Pastor Amy? What are some of the habits that you have personally? You're a phenomenal leader. You run Charisma. It, it's a, there's, I know that your time management is, is, has to be on point. What are some personal things that you do as a leader that maybe we could glean from? You promised me you weren't going to ask hard questions, and there you go. <laughs> What's your <laughs> exercise routine, your podcast Look at list, me. your playlist? <laughs> no, I've got, I think I have decent habits. I've just finished reading a book for the fifth time. I'm just working through it, yeah. it and I'm not going to promote the book, but it's just a good book. It's deep work. Okay. And the concept of deep work, I think I've lived it and I didn't know it, uh -huh. but it's that early morning time where I get up around 3.30 oh, or 4 and I'm at my desk at 5 and I want my fingers <gasps> on a keyboard by 6. I'm yeah. disciplined in wow. when I do what. And so that by the time anybody comes in the door, I'm more open, I'm, I'm able, I've done it, I've got something put away, I've written some oh, good stuff good. maybe. Because wow. I write every day, I have to write every day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to keep up with what I've got to so do with write magazines. So you early before yes. the day gets Because there's no chance when people come in because I can't be that guy. When I walk down the hall, I want to stop and see eyes. Mm -hmm. I say that I think somehow in the book, yeah. that it's eyes to eyes. Mm -hmm. That's what really matters where I can stop, look at a person and listen to them. That, that's leadership, I think. Wow. Well, thank you for showing us yes. and telling us we're not done. Okay. Yeah. We're going to take a pause for the news yes, sir. and we're going to come back and we're going to get engaged perhaps with our pastors Thank you but for spending so time. Good. oh well, don't get don't 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 leave the don't building leave. yet
You ain't Don't got, leave, you ain't Bernie. done yet, brother. Don't leave, Andy. We're, Andy, stay on board. Andy, stay on. Let's, let's go now and see what cities found in the news. The Church of Confederate General Robert E. Lee has voted to drop his name. After two years of intense debate, church leaders changed R. E. Lee Memorial Church to Grace Episcopal Church. According to the Washington Post, the name change is in an effort to seek racial healing and in response to the deadly riots in Charlottesville. Some church members left the church over years because of the name. Others were in favor of keeping it. The church's rector said this, Charlottesville seems to have moved us to this point. Not that we have a different view of Lee historically in our church, but we have appreciation for our need to move on. Affirm Films is set to start production on a movie about the Apostle Paul. The inspirational drama will follow the life of Paul under the Roman Empire. The movie stars Jim Caviezel, James Faulkner, and Oliver Martinez. Christian Newswire reports filming is on location in Malta. The film is set to release in 2018. Well, that's all for God in the Headlines. Have a great day on Purpose. Do you want to know a secret? The Real Life Newsletter is the best thing that I get in my mailbox each and every month. Packed with interesting articles, inspiring testimonials from viewers, and behind the scenes news from Cornerstone Network, the Real Life Newsletter keeps me up to date with the shows I love. Every newsletter comes with a handy program guide, so I always know what's on. Call today for your Real Life Newsletter. You're going to love it. You may have heard people on Cornerstone mention Roku, but what is it? Roku is a device that connects to your television and streams thousands of channels from all around the world, including CTVN. You can watch your favorite Cornerstone shows 24-7 anywhere from around the world. Roku is helping us take the gospel as far as possible and as quickly as possible. For more information on how to connect with us on Roku, go to ctvn.org slash Roku. We're privileged to have with us Dr. Steve Green, and we're talking about leadership. His new book, Love Leads, is available in bookstores everywhere. Come to our website, ctvn.org, and we'll point you out to places where you can get it. And Dr. Green, I, I, I'm still fascinated by the idea of love being the, the empirical standard. Mm -hmm. So we've always put that kind of as a emotional connection, not an right. empirical connection where it's not tangible, you know? So to lead with love, it has to be tangible. It does, and if you look at the Bible, it's very tangible. It, it isn't mushy. There, there's not a lot of opportunities there. You don't see a lot of pats on a back, and you can do it, go get them. It's just like, get it done. Jesus was very clear with his disciples when he corrected them. And then I remember the prayer garden where they kept going to sleep. And right at the end of that section where he begins to ask them to come on, he just says, now, get up, let's go. He said what he needed to say to them, and then he said, let's go. He went right back to work. He got people in place. So much in correction and discipline, it feels like uh, maybe punishment, like I've got to say this thing to you. I want to get after you so I feel better. And we know that's not good at home, and it's certainly not good at work. So what do we do? We make note of it, and we keep them moving, you know, very much oriented back toward the goal. What are our goals? What are we trying to do? How do you feel this fit in? I love to correct the questions. Mm -hmm. I try not to make oh, too many statements and ask a lot more questions. Yeah. Well, because confrontation is part of being a leader, and sometimes it doesn't feel like you're walking in love. Or can I actually speak the truth and say what I really need to say in confrontation? What does that look like? Yeah, that's good. We question. have to confront or we're not leading. You know, we can't let things stay the same. We can't be lackadaisical just so we can be loved. I was teasing with my staff this week. We had a moment together <laughs> where it was late in the afternoon, 3, 3.30. And I said, I've got to change the name of my book to Love Leads in the Morning. Because <laughs> this afternoon, I ain't feeling real good about things. You know? And sometimes our, our self shows up. And, you know, luckily we can correct or, you know, with the grace of God, with the Holy Spirit telling me, you're, you're not where I want you to be. I've got a chapter on... Uh, Leaders don't need to roar. I've always wondered yeah. why kings lions, don't roar, kings right? don't need to roar. Yeah. We don't. We, get, we can talk softly and be soft spoken and, mm -hmm. it, and 
in most cases, say everything and do what we need to do without ever raising our voice wow. or changing our body language. Wow. Get me convicted. I'm starting to feel, feel the Selfie. conviction, Pastor. Well, you know, one of the things I love, Dr. Green, that I heard you mention is I love the fact and should be applauded that he leads out of his family. Yeah. Um, everything that you're modeling isn't just about ministry. A lot of times we read that book, how do I get my ministry to grow? If you can grow your family, I believe you can grow your church. Mm -hmm. It's so just as simple. It, right? That's right. You know, we. We work hard at it. That's the, the, the thing that I've said when I started my career, my life, that I may fail in every business I start or everything that I do, but I will not fail in the home. Amen. And I've said it since I was 19. I got married at 19. And by the grace of God and mercy, grace, 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 we've been able to, you know, to keep that word. And I'm thrilled with my children, with my grandchildren, wow. and it's passing on because we modeled it in the home. That's awesome. And, and a lot of credit goes to my wife, as every man in here knows. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't know your wife, <laughs> but amen. Let's go out to Tom. He's out with our pastors with a question from one of our pastors. Well, Dr. Green, one lion that I know that doesn't roar but leads is Ron Kozor. Pastor Ron Kozor is at Alpha Lions Den Ministry, and he's a former uh, uh, center Yes, sir. With the Detroit Lions and uh, a wonderfully anointed ministry, you have an anointing in your ministry for leading. And I wonder if you have a question of Dr. Green. Absolutely. Pastor Amy took like 10 of them, but, I, but I'll try to pull one out here. I've always had a problem, um, even since I was younger in ministry, to be able, I've heard a guy say before, you could tell a good leader by looking behind him to see how many people were following him. And I've always wanted to lead without losing. And what I mean by that is be a good leader without losing the people who are following me as a leader. That's good. And um, so when we stand on the Word of God and want to lead that way properly, I have a problem with the people I lose by making a stand for what is right. That's a good word, but I would say to you that our number one goal as a leader, I think the first thing that makes a leader a leader is what happens to the people that we've led. I watch how they grow. I want to know at the end of every year when we do evaluations, mm -hmm. how are you different this year than you were at the beginning of the year? And then I, I'll get my own evaluation based on how my team has grown. And I think that addresses your point, Pastor, that my effort, my energy has to be in growing people. And the other good marker is what happens when we leave the building. A lot of people say, yeah, you don't know how lucky you are to have me. You know, if I wasn't here, this place would crush. You've just said you're no kind of leader. Right. You know, when I'm gone, it should now. be operating exactly the same as when I'm there. That's and good. when I leave, there should be a legacy leader to come in and, and take over. That's good. Very Thank good. you, and, and most organizations don't go there. I agree. Most don't because mm -hmm. we don't have secession plans in most places. And most don't have God in the center of their business, well, those yeah. folks. The people yeah. who are God-centered, who are led by the Holy Spirit, this message will get in their heart. Mm -hmm. it, it has nothing to do with my book. Mm -hmm. I think God puts it in our heart. We just have to keep our head alert to it. Tom. Another important quality of a great leader is to create a vision. And at the risk of embarrassing Dr. Kennedy, I just have to say, Daryl, I don't know that I've ever met a leader or a preacher that creates a more clear vision for his people than what God has blessed you. I wonder if you have a question of Dr. Green about leadership. Hello, Dr. Green. Hi, Pastor. I'm very interested in moving from success to significance. So many times we in the marketplace, we look at success, but we're in the body of Christ, we should be significant. And I want to get your take on that. I live that exact phrase because I worked successfully in business. I did a lot of things and we don't want to take our TV time with that. But I was very much a businessman. I knew I was a business pastor that I was called to lay hands on sick businesses to help, to consult, to move them forward. And Brother Oral Roberts helped me to understand that, obviously, that he was called to lay hands on sick people. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work with business mm -hmm. and, and help them. But getting back to the thought of how to grow it and how to make them better, it's just about that, that thing that we all find. It's consistency. It's knowing where we're going next. And I don't think I answered your question. Okay. But you can, you can ask a follow-up. That's okay. I want to make sure I, I, I get to you. Well, I think we have to go from, you know, just being successful. Uh, to, back because, to the significance. Yeah, the significance. world's viewpoint is for everybody to be on top. But God's viewpoint that the first will be last and the last should be first. Yes. So we have to humble ourselves down and allow God to get the glory through our lives. That's good. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I'm going to just say that significance real quickly is what we do with other people. That when we go on and people still remember what you did for them, we, we could all talk about people that really 
uh, imparted to us, impacted us, taught us. To me, th that's my job. That's what I've got to do. That's when I'll become significant. Amen. If I talk about my p and I talk about how many people, as soon as they get to heaven, they're going to take out their resumes for the Lord. <laughs> you know, here's my business card, sir. Look at that title there and yeah. my great resume. And God's going to say, I never knew you. You know, what I know is how you treated people and how you grew people. Wow. And that's the thing that we're all working for. That's significant, that's sir. Good. Thank you, Pastor. Well, when, what, if, what if somebody on your team is wrongly placed mm -hmm. and you have to deal with that by uh, releasing them? Yes. Mm -hmm. How do you do that and do it in love? Really good question. Uh, have good outsourcing. And that, that's not meant to be funny, but it is. But always make sure that we can help whoever it is that they're just not happy either. I like to tell them, I'm not happy, you're not happy, let's both get happy. Mm -hmm. And so the answer is to get you out of this pressure position that you put yourself in. You're under pressure because you don't have the skills for this job. You're a great person. God loves you. You're misplaced. You got here and just stayed and the job grew around you or things happened. So let's find a place, because I know your skills and I write about your skills, what the good things. I don't talk about their weaknesses. No one that I've ever asked to leave a company has been surprised. We coach, we coach, we coach, mm -hmm. and until I can't coach any longer. Mm -hmm. You know, then the team begins to question me if I keep someone on the, the team that keeps dropping football yeah. passes. Right. You know, if the football's thrown at me and I keep dropping it, the team is gonna say, what kind of leader are you? Get this guy moving. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is done with love when I move them forward, when I get them focused on what's next. That's mm -hmm. good. No, that's good. Thank you. How that's long good. of a time period do you take in that process? It's not quick. I, I'm always, uh, I really want to make sure that I know that I'm hearing the Lord, I'm not acting out of my own flesh. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not easy. But at the same time, I know that it has to happen. When I know it, they know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That this is going to happen. Yeah. Uh, what can we do between now and then? Yeah. And how can you start looking? I don't like to surprise people. Let's go for our last question out with Tom. Pastor Dan Kramer, his daughter Stephanie, went on a missions trip to Venezuela. She had a calling. While she was there, she met her future husband. He has a calling and now has a dynamic ministry to Spanish-speaking people, a growing population in the Pittsburgh area at Iglesia Cristiana Sion. Your question for Dr. Green. As Tom said, I lead a Hispanic church, and we have about 13 to 14 different countries in our church represented. God bless. People think that, you know, because we're Hispanic, we're all the same, but I quickly found out after preaching a couple of messages that everybody has their own version of Spanish. <laughs> and, so, and so I had to figure out how to standardize the way I speak so I can reach the people. But I also found out quickly that, as you say, to lead, you have to love, but also to Everybody has their own idea of love. So not everybody understands love the same way. And so I am in this cultural context where everybody doesn't get love the same way I get. It. Or uh, so Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala, Salvador, Puerto Rico. And so how do you uh, go about loving people or finding out or, or you know, honing on the, the, that skill so that people can feel loved the way they need to be loved. You're all over it, Pastor. You're right there. I think, obviously, that love is an international language. And it doesn't matter what language you speak or your cultural background. If you become the center of my attention, how do I win the family in my home? Make them the center of my attention. Listen to them, engage with them, give them time. You know, and anyone in our church, and, and I was advised very poorly by a pastor when we built our building in Bixby, was to, uh, build a back door so I could get out at the end of the sermon and, and not have to deal with it. <laughs> and I listened and then I locked the door and never used it. I had to, had to get corrected on it. Mm -hmm. But the difference became when I really started spending time with people and I did sort of, kind of, but not like I should have. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that more is better. It's just more time is better because they only see me in this fishbowl. They only see you pastors in a fishbowl and they watch the fish swim around and they cause value judgments. and. You know, my fishbowl's got some dirt in it. You know, I got to get it cleaned out every now and then, like, like every day, and, and make sure that what they see is someone that's trying, not someone who's achieved, who's there, who's accomplished, uh, but God. And in that, if they can see how the grace of God is on us and how the anointing really breaks the yoke, those are the things that I think people need to see is that we're dealing with everything they are in a very real way. Leaders need to say to every worker, I'm fighting the same battle you are. I'm trying to get this done. You, right. you don't see the pressure on me. 
I, you see what I'm doing to you, doing to you mm -hmm. instead of with you. But mm -hmm. the, the essence is to just be loving and inclusive, inclusive, inclusive. Wow. Well, thank you, Good pastors, advice. for contributing to the program and asking some very important questions. Very good. Rich. I was a little nervous about this segment. A little, you never know what I kind know, of questions yeah. you're going to get. So yeah. you guys did really, really good. Uh, we want to tell you a story now. We want to show you a story of, of how God supernaturally answers prayer. And when a wife prays about her husband after he suffered a, a medical emergency, let's listen to this testimony. God's love for us endures forever, as does my love for my husband. But my beloved was almost taken from me when his heart almost gave way. It was about two years ago on that dreaded day in which my husband began to complain of chest pain. I had no time to think, only time to react. I grabbed my keys and rushed him straight to the hospital. Once there, I knew he was now in God's hands, as well as those of the doctors. I can remember calling Cornerstone and praying with a prayer partner. We prayed together for God's healing and recovery for my dear husband. Now, here we are two years later, and my husband is heading back to work for the first time since his heart attack. Not only did God heal my husband, but he brought us both closer to him than ever. Praise be to God. Pastor Jay, we believe at Cornerstone that God's in the healing business. Oh, man. Amen. This is not changed. It hasn't gone away. With a, some believe, people believe when the Bible was published, the, the miracle gifts went away. Or when the last apostle would, went to be with Jesus, John, that it all went away. Uh, we believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we hear testimonies about healing, it stirs me up to say, God's still in the healing delivery, uh, the same business that he's always been in. You know, it's good to know because, you know, sometimes the medical community doesn't have any answers. And sometimes you don't know where to turn, but it's good to know that I'm glad that's a misnomer. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that they don't, that, that God still does heal for today and that we can call on him at any time and be able to receive that healing touch. And that's what's so great. You can call at any time, 24-7-365-888-665-4483. And we have anointed prayer partners that are here to believe God with you for a supernatural healing in your life. One of my favorite scriptures, Jesus went around. This is what he did, doing good and healing all who are sick yeah, all. and oppressed of the devil. And you know, not all healing is just cancer, arthritis, old Arthur, you know, my toenail fungus. It's not all that. <laughs> Sometimes it's mental healing. <laughs> Sometimes it's healing of a broken heart. I mean, people are going through all yeah. kinds oh, yeah. of really hard situations, but that's what Jesus does. Amen. He gets in our mess with us. He goes down in the pit and it says he actually lifts us up out of the pit mm -hmm. and he sets our feet on solid rock. So I don't know what you're going through today, but I know that with Jesus, you can overcome and you can make Amen. it through and we're praying for you and we're agreeing with you for that, that next step that you'll see clearly what to do next in your life. And that's important. Mm -hmm. That's important because our walk in faith is exactly that. It's a walk. It's a walk. There's motion. You don't stand in faith. You walk in faith. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you, you, you don't stand still in, in, in your dynamic relationship with God. He's always moving us. Yeah. He's always taking us, Dr. It's Green, to another place. Even if it's very dark today. Mm -hmm. Even if we're, in, if we're in that worst day of our life mode. You know, and then sometimes that happens. Circumstances come at you. You're facing challenges that you can't deal with, you don't have answers to, but with that faith in God's love, we're able to get through it, move through it, and watch Him work in, in miraculous ways. Well, Pastor Amy was going to ask me, she did offset, about when things are going bad and, and we're the leader. Mm -hmm. And what I've tr tried to model, not 100% successful, but my goal is when my team is at their worst, I want to be at my best. Mm -hmm. I don't want to yes. show them worry and fret. I don't want to show feeble wringing hands and feeble knees. I, I want to show them really the most strength that God has given me at a time when they don't see the future, when they can't see a way out, mm -hmm. when there's up upheaval, 
You know, we've all had organizations that get into those places where things are just rough. Yeah. And that's the time when a leader really is, uh, earns the stripes yeah. by calming yeah. the field, being that airline pilot that says, we've been through this before, just a little turbulence, we'll be okay. Yeah. Well, you said <laughs> leaders need to be at their best when the team is at its worst. Yes, and sometimes a sickness will come in your organization and something will happen or something will spread that is really, uh, has a demonic force behind it yes. and that's not that the is. time to cower and I mean there have been times to be quite honest I just wanted to lay in bed put the go back to Oklahoma you know <laughs> yes. where the wind comes sweeping through the plains and just <laughs> ignore it hide run from it but leaders you say we got to get in front of it yeah and even if I don't feel it I mean that's this faith notion again when I don't feel it when I'm feeling kind of what they are in my heart yep that to act as if, move forward, tr putting my trust where it belongs. Mm -hmm. And we come through it. Leaders have to lead through those valleys. Amen. Do you think it's fair to say that God wants all of us to be leaders? Or is some people Ooh, called not to lead but to follow? And, and there's a time and a place for both. I think everyone is born to lead because we're told to make disciples, mm -hmm. to lead people to Christ. Yeah, that's right. And we're all going to be in that position where we have to lead someone to some place. Uh, my wife is a wonderful leader. She never was anywhere near the front of the church. Mm -hmm. She was cleaning bathrooms, cleaning, cleaning, always doing something that no one saw. Mm -hmm. And yet she was a powerful leader because people, women saw it. They noticed her. Mm -hmm. They saw it, but not from the front. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the whole essence. I, I want to get to this point, too, about the golden rule. I think it's something that uh, I really don't want to leave without making sure we understand mm -hmm. that there's always ex more is expected of a leader than of the team. And when Jesus said, you know, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. I think that's a minimum standard for a leader. Mm -hmm. That what I try to do and what I, and I try to teach is to do more for others than they would ever expect from, for us to do. For, I don't expect anything in return. I, and I mean that. I really think I can say that with my heart with truth. That I want to treat them better than I expect to be treated. And we can do that. We, we cover a lot of problems in companies, in personal relationships. It's just to treat people better with more understanding than I would ever receive. Mm -hmm. You've given us a lot to think about. No. Good. So all of us as, as leaders, we have to put this into our heart and you at home as your leader. And I love the answer, we're all called to lead in some way, mm -hmm. in some avenue to somebody who's looking for you to be a light to them. That's what really that is, light in their darkness. That's what a leader's going to do is provide light in a dark time. And so when we step into that realm, now you can choose not to. Mm -hmm. You can choose to go back to Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. if, if, but thank God you didn't. Yeah. We're glad you're here. <laughs> but, but you could choose to go back. Yeah. And many people do choose mm -hmm. to just step out of it and go, well, you know, this is just more than I got to deal with. I, yeah. It was easier back in Egypt. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Back in Egypt, it was a lot easier back there. And that's a natural uh, inclination is to look back to the past and whitewash it in some way mm -hmm. where what was horrible, mm -hmm. we now make okay in light of what's not okay today. You know, so well, God wants us to move forward in faith. And we're so thankful that you came and yes. were part of the program. So Dr. Green has written a book, great book called Love Leads. Come to our website, you'll find out how to get it. And uh, I would highly recommend that you get a copy for yourself and for your family. Let's stay home. Let's keep it in home. Because, you know, if the church, if the family gets good leadership, then it's going to migrate into the church. And if the church gets to be good leaders, then it's going to migrate into the community. Then the community is going to have more leaders, Christian godly men and women who will step up and run for office and take positions of authority. And if that happens in the community, then it happens in the state. Then if it happens in the state, maybe it'll happen in the region. And then maybe we'll see it across the nation. And that's that great awakening that I believe God's sending, it's gonna start in the home. We pray because we believe. And we end every program with prayer. Let's pray together. Pastor, stretch your hand out towards these prayer requests. Father God, thank you for meeting the needs of every one of these precious ones, Lord. Thank you, Father, that they called for prayer. That means they believe in you, God. They're waiting for you to answer them, Lord. And we release faith right now in Jesus.
Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.